This is a talk about uh, Forest Gate and how it developed from uh, a tiny village to a substantial suburb. And also we'll touch on issues of gentrification since that's such a topical theme at the moment. And just to look at this uh, main slide that uh, you've seen on your screen, and uh, this is Forest Gate Centre around about 1905, 1908. And there are one or two familiar features here, especially the clock and uh, the drinking fountain. And uh, some of you may know that the clock, as part of recent repaving work associated with Crossrail, the clock disappeared but has now come back in a slightly different location. But it's a familiar landmark in Forest Gate. And those of you who know the area well will recognize some of those buildings still surviving and Seabut Road. I make no apologies for starting a history talk with a picture of a modern estate agent in Forest Gate, because this, in many ways, is the story of. Uh, building on the rural fringes of London, of speculation, of the impact of new railway lines in Forest Gate, of uh, major housing developers, uh, large population growth, and waves of newcomers and migrants. But our story is basically about the 19th century and less about the 21st century. But some of the th same themes, of course, occur in both. And that's why Mark and I, as historians, enjoy the work we do so much as we try to relate some of the things we see in the history with contemporary, the contemporary scene. And Forest Gate was very much a village. So here you have quite a famous map done of the area in the 18th century and here you can see quite distinctly those villages and the village names that are so, so familiar to us <coughs> excuse me Stratford, West Ham, Plastow, Upton, East Ham and I would ask you to pay particular attention just at the top there to that phrase eagle and child just fix on that because we're going to come back to that. That more or less marks the location of the modern forest gate. So just bear eagle and child in mind as we go through. And here's a sort of um, zoomed in version. And again, just at the bottom there, notice that eagle and child, and there's the building there. It's a pub and uh, we'll see it in a photograph before too long, but also notice on this picture, uh, this phrase here, the lower forest, because this is the, uh, the, the kind of shaded area, is Epping Forest. And notice how it reaches down, right down to the eagle and child. And that's because the forest did indeed come right down to Forest Gate. And here's some other maps. Um, from that same 18th century, just different styles of maps and, and giving you slightly different views. But again, you see the eagle and child there. And again, there's the pub there again. And you can see how it relates to Epping Forest. So Forest Gate, very much a very rural location in the 18th century. Hardly any houses, just the odd building. But then, of course, there's the transformation that is brought about by the Industrial Revolution, by the coming of the railway, and I'm just going to run my cursor along the line of what was the Eastern Counties Railway, built in the 1830s, now the Liverpool Street Shenfield Line, and of course uh, Cross Rail as well. And that railway and the other railways you see, and the industrialization of West Ham has this really dramatic effect. You can still see uh, Wanstead Flats there at the top, just moving my cursor over once they're flat. And the eagle and child is located about there. And you can see the phrase forest gate. So dramatic change from the 18th to the 19th century. And in the 18th century, and indeed into the 19th century, 
Um, the area of Forest Gate, um, both north and south of the Romford Road, was marked by the presence of a number of very grand houses uh, of the local gentry. So these are not aristocrats, but they are wealthy gentry families. And this is quite a well-known one. This is Upton House with its own landscape grounds. And those landscape grounds eventually became the public park that we now know as West Ham Park. So this is the same location. So a rather grand house occupied mainly by uh, families from a religious group called the Quakers. There were a whole series of these houses adjacent to Upton Lane and uh, the Quakers kind of concentrated in this area and they were they tended to intermarry and some of those Quaker families have very familiar well-known names so there's the Barclays who uh, founded Barclays Bank there's Elizabeth Fry the prison reformer who has links to the Fry's chocolate family um, and uh, another very important prominent family called Gurney and Gurn, the Gurney family owned much of the land on which modern Forest Gate is built. And then there were other families as well, such as the Buxtons. So a series of, 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 of uh, Quaker religious families intermarrying and owning land in this, running their business premises in the city of London, but these were their country houses. And uh, this is on the, this was, this building was on the portway. Some of you who know the borough well, We'll know on the portway there's a territorial army base there uh, for the regiment called the rifles and this property stood on the site of the territorial army base on the portway and this house also has associations with elizabeth fry the prison reformer and other prominent quaker families and you can see these are very substantial properties here's another one this is a little further north. This is on uh, uh, Seabert Road, uh, or was on Seabert Road, and is, is, is the site of Woodgrange and Godwin School. This is West Ham Hall, and this was occupied by a man called Tanner. And rather remarkably, um, a small fragment of this building um, survives, and here it is. So this is Cranmer Road. This is the coach house of uh, this building. It survives into the modern landscape, still there today, and is a small industrial building. And uh, they, um, they're a very um, uh, specialized firm. They make glass vessels for laboratories. So a very interesting use, but a very interesting building and, a, and, a, and a, an odd survival of one of these gentry houses. Um, Forest Gate gets its name really from an actual gate and here is a representation of it in the um, mid 19th century. Not at all sure how accurate this drawing is but at least it gives you the impression of um, the forest and then some kind of barrier. It wasn't a toll gate in the traditional sense of the word. I don't think human beings paid tolls as they passed through this gate but herds of cattle the owners would have had to pay some kind of fee as they came off the forest land where they'd been grazing and they would be walked to Smithfield Meat Market in central London uh, down the Mile End Road and um, some kind of toll was paid by the cow owners in passing through this gate. And the next slide shows the exact location of that gate. So that is the same place and we know that for certain. And on the right there, you have the Eagle and Child again. This is the Victorian version of the pub. Um, there was a much earlier building. This is a rather grand um, um, late 19th century building. And if you look carefully on the, uh, when you're next passing on the face of the building, you will still see part of the original um, pub sign uh, built into the building. And that is the Eagle and Child, which I think refers back to possibly to a Greek myth, I think. And then on the left there, you have the Lord Lister Health Centre, and you can see the, um, the uh, Barking Gospel Oak Railway Line uh, on the bridge there. So that's, that is the location of the Forest Gate. Because Forest Gate, as I've mentioned, was a very rural location. It was an area of farms and open land, forest land, but also farms. And one of the most famous was this one, 
uh, Aldersbrook farm, um, which survived as a farm until the mid 1850s, when it was purchased by the city of London and uh, was converted into what we know as the city of London cemetery. In a different talk we give, we talk about the significance of the city of London taking over that farm and creating the cemetery because that had a key role in the saving of Rapping Forest from building development. We like this picture very much. This is um, a representation of the coming of the railway to this area. Um, so this is in the 1830s. I've mentioned the significance of the arrival of the railway because of course it allowed travel into central London and it really um, kick-started the housing development in Forest Gate as uh, developers were attracted to this agricultural land which was adjacent to this brand new railway which allowed people to travel into London for work. So in the same way that Crossrail, when it eventually arrives in Forest Gate, um, is stimulated development and no doubt will stimulate further development. So the original arrival of the railway in the 1830s um, had a massive stimulus effect on Forest Gate. And here's, uh, I'll just leave this on the screen for a moment and uh, you can read it. Uh, this just summarizes the story according to the local newspaper in the late 19th century. And the quote emphasized is the easy access um, to London enabled by the railways, reasonable rents and a first class local market, which I, which I take to be, um, you know, a very good shopping street in Woodgrange Road. I've mentioned this extraordinary uh, population growth in, this is just West Ham. So this is not the modern London borough of Newark. Newham is made up of two old boroughs, East Ham and West Ham, and the name Newham was just an artificial creation in 1965, a way of combining the two boroughs. But what you see here in just West Ham, so not East Ham, this extraordinary population growth, really exponential from the mid 19th century through to the First World War period. If you notice the population of West Ham alone reached 300,000, the modern population of the London borough of Newham twice the size was, is about 325,000. So you appreciate the scale of the population growth in West Ham. And in fact, West Ham depopulated after the Second World War because of bombing and other changes. So exponential population growth. And um, Forest Gate was a focus of, of where many of these people lived, of course, these new people. And again, I'll just leave this slide up for just a moment, just give you a chance just to glimpse over that. So we've just picked here the 1891 census. We've just picked a couple of roads of different character. Hampton Road rather grander, Tilney Road middling, I suppose, and Field Road maybe slightly lower down the uh, social scale. And you just get a sense there of the kind of people who were living here. And it's a very mixed community. Many clerks, these are people who do secretarial work and go into the, um, mostly male, but not all, go into London to service the offices of the great financial and other institutions, travelling in on the train, but also notice other quite uh, middle class professions, the retired surgeon, a surgical instrument maker, teachers of course, so Forest Gate had a very wide social mix in the late 19th century in the different types of houses that we're going to now show you. So here's a quite an interesting house on Capel Road. These plaques, uh, we're going to show you a couple of these because these plaques are interesting at a number of levels, not least of course they give a date for the development of that particular house. So you get a sense of how the roads developed. So here's Capel Road, 1887, a little later than some parts of Forest Gate. This house, in fact, we know from research, is one of a pair, a semi-detached pair. Mark lives in one of them. And uh, these, in fact, were developed with money from a, a man from Bristol who had made his money in making sails for sailing ships. That's how he made his fortune. He somehow ended up in East London and he invested some of his money 
in developing two houses. And this emphasizes that much development in Forest Gate, although it looks like uniform terraces, was actually developed in a very piecemeal fashion, in bits and pieces. And uh, here's a uh, take, this is taken from a title deed, just uh, along from Bath Villa. This is also Capel Road, so you've got Wanstead Flats at the top. And um, this is taken from a friend of mine's title deeds. And notice a, a rather odd thing here. You can see the houses uh, and the house plots, but they actually own a little strip of land on the other side of the highway on Capel Road, actually on the edge of Wanstead Flats. And indeed, some of those houses still do own a little strip of Wanstead Flats. And title deeds can be a very useful source of information of how schemes develop. The PH there, by the way, is the Golden Fleece pub, which many of you are familiar with. And um, here's my own road, Lawn Road Forest Gate. And again, just emphasizing the piecemeal nature of development. Here's my house, uh, this one here, where my pointer is. Uh, this is 71 Lawn Road. And notice that uh, although it is now in the modern geography, uniform terraces, when it was developed, it was developed in this piecemeal fashion. So three houses. And then this um, symbol here on the Ordnance Survey map is actually for greenhouse. So this is a commercial greenhouse in other words, a market garden. And market gardening was a prominent feature of Forest Gate in the early stages. And you can see how fragmented the terraces are. Uh, this is, my house was built in 1878. This uh, map was done in 1890, in the 1890s. So 15 years after my house was built, it's quite fragmented. And there are these other uses like um, commercial greenhouses. That house there, that one there, uh, is slightly different from the other houses in the road. And here it is, you can see how it looks different. And then the smaller terraces to the right. So quite piecemeal development. And it may have been the home of the uh, market gardener. Here's another um, rather odd situation. It, it, this again looks like a complete terrace, but if you look very carefully, this house is actually detached. Uh, you could see there's a two or three inch gap there, and there's also a two or three inch gap there. So what looks like a terraced house, is in fact rather weirdly a detached house um, with those gaps. And again, um, I've mentioned the importance of plaques. And it, as you go around, do do look up at the plaques because they give you dates. So that's so I think says Woodstock Villas, 1876. And here's a, this is a slight cheat because actually this is not in Forest Gate. It's just over the border in Leytonstone. But this is a rather unusual plaque. It actually tells you the builder, and you don't often see those. So this house built by Dupre in the 1880s. And again, just to emphasize how these terraces developed in a rather piecemeal fashion. So this is Forest Gate south of the Rumford Road in the 1890s Ordnance Survey map. And you can see there are incomplete terraces. And just notice here too, here's one of these surviving gentry houses, Plashet Hall. And here it is. Uh, Plashet Hall, but also known as Potato Hall because the family that were based here, the Green Hills, where prominent growers of potatoes, onions, and other vegetables on land south. They, they owned a lot of land south of the house. This house was on the Romford Road, junction of Catherine Road. And uh, also fascinatingly, um, the house had a lantern on the top because um, Mr. Greenhill was an owner of ships. He could uh, look out from the top of his house and see the ships on the Thames. Another substantial building that survives, this is on Danes Road. Um, you just, as you're walking along Danes Road, you just need to look through a gateway and then you see this rather grand house dating from the 1840s that survives. And Danes Road had a number of prominent houses. And another view of Danes Road, so this is rather fuzzy, this is taken from an old postcard, but just focus on this building, which is the pub, the Forest Glen. So this is Danes Road looking north, and uh, there's the Forest Glen as it is today, sadly no longer a pub and um, various dubious things going on there at the moment. But um, you can see how um, uh, some of these uh, interesting Victorian buildings survive. And uh, this is at the top of Dames Road. And um, we like this photo because it's, it's really unusual to see the terraces actually under development. There are very few photographs, but if you look carefully here, you can actually see construction going on and it just gives you a little feel for what it was like when the terraces were being developed and of course in the front here is one of the ponds on on Wanstead Flats uh, this became known as the model yacht pond and, and and is now known as the Jubilee Pond 
you can't get exactly the same view today because the lake is bigger now and in the way. But this, I, I can assure you, this is the same terrace under development as we see there. That is basically the same bit of the road, top end of Danes Road. And here's a little uh, quote, uh, and again, I'll just give you a moment to read that concerning Dames Road. So again, the idea of clerks and business people who travel into the city on the railway. And this book, um, this West Ham book from 1907, is a mine of information about social conditions, rents, and many other aspects of the development of West Ham. At that point, I'm going to hand over to Mark. Thank you, Peter. Um, and um, uh, I'm going to start where Peter left off, really, with a different sort of development um, in Forest Gate. Most of the developments that Peter's talked about, um, as he said, were very piecemeal. This is the exception. This is the Woodgrange estate, started in 1877 on um, land um, uh, which had been part of Woodgrange Manor House, and it was Market Gardens when it was taken over, built by the Corbett family, uh, father and son, Thomas and Archibald. But you can see the, these streets are quite uniform, very large houses, many of them detached, but each of the streets looks very much the same. Unlike other parts of Forest Gate, it was developed uh, all as one estate. And so uh, the next slide shows uh, people wanted to uh, make it more personal and each each house looking the same at the front but very different at the back. This rather charming very formal photograph was taken by Edward Wright who's a uh, the local photographer of choice. Everybody had their picture taken by Edward Wright um, in Forest Gate between the 1890s and uh, the First World War. Um, you can see this very posed family but look around them at the garden. It's a classic Victorian garden with Agapanthus growing on the left-hand side here, with nasturtiums in the bed on the other side. Right. And um, in the foreground here, um, I think they're probably asters growing here, and ivy and, um, ivy and um, ferns in pot plants behind. What this picture, of course, doesn't show, show us is how the family actually looked when they were uh, doing the gardening in the back garden. Uh, Forest Gate um, had a horticultural society by this time. And, and gardening was becoming a very popular hobby. The next slide shows um, a rather different uh, arrival in Forest Gate. Uh, this is Manor Park Cemetery Company. Um, we saw Manor Park Cemetery on the, the map a little earlier on. Forest Gate was continuing to grow in the 1870s, but it was still, as Peter said, very much on the rural fringe. And London was running short of space for cemeteries, central London cemeteries, were quite literally overflowing by the 1850s. In fact, Dickens gives a very graphic description of um, a, a City of London cemetery in which the, um, the, uh, uh, the graves were um, actually overspilling into the street. So not only a public corporation like the City of London with their big cemetery opened in 1856, but also private companies like the Manor Park Cemetery Company here um, bought land and developed cemeteries. The cemetery company actually still runs Manor Park Cemetery, the same family still runs it today. They bought a, a very large piece of land between Forest Gate and Manor Park, wanted a very, wanted a very uh, large cemetery. And uh, thank you, so somebody's saying it's the end of Seabit Road, I should, have, I should have pointed that out, this gateway here. And there was a lot of residential opposition to the cemetery. And here's a letter from a local newspaper with a local resident nervous about the type of mourners who would turn up at, at the graves at the cemetery. So in fact, the local vestry, which was the local government at the time, refused the cemetery permission to have a very large space and they had to content themselves with just a third of the land they wanted. Now that left them, as the next slide shows, with a lot of surplus land. And in 1885, they sold this off. Now, they were obviously clearly mindful of local residents and their, their desire for a respectable neighbourhood. So see, these are some of the rules of sale. And these were houses built on the land between Capel Road um, and Forest Gate Station. So they were infilling uh, houses on that land. So you weren't allowed to have any shops or workshops. Uh, you weren't allowed to have a pub. 
you see some of these rules were actually broken very soon after the sale of uh, land was made and you certainly weren't allowed any beds in sheds um, and if anybody discovered that you bought uh, you built a, a workshop or a pub your neighbors were allowed to break down your fences and do anything necessary to remove the uh, offending property so there were a large number of developments in Forest Gate and you can see here this is the Tottenham and Forest Gate Railway Company which is now of course the goblet the goblet the Gospel Oak to Barking Line. Uh, Tottenham Forest Gate Railway bought up a huge swathe of land across North East London and in the teeth of opposition all the way along the route they built uh, their line on viaducts through to Barking. And at the end of the construction, they found themselves with a lot of excess land left over. So they sold this off by auction in 1893. And interestingly, you can see here, the blue arrow is showing the, what they expected people to do with the property they bought. Occupation was certainly one possibility, but investment and speculation were what they were uh, emphasizing. This was a time building boom and people um, were buying as Peter has shown, small plots of land uh, for speculative purposes and, and developing small terraces of houses. Uh, and the next slide shows what you could get for, here's what you could get for your money. In Seabot Road, you could buy a four bedroom house here from the railway company. Uh, and notice here on the upper floor, there was a bathroom, but it was unfitted. Um, some of the uh, houses they sold on, on the estates around the railway did actually have fitted bathrooms, but this means that actually, although there was a, a room for a bath upstairs, very unusual in the 1890s, it had not been fitted out, but it was uh, not considered necessary to have an inside loo. The, out, the toilet is still outside in the garden. And I'm sure many of you have houses where there is an, an outhouse, which was formerly the loo. You can see at the bottom here, how much um, you pay for rent, two pounds a month, uh, for the sitting tenants in these two houses. And remember, most people were renting in Forest Gate at the time. A clerk or a skilled worker would be earning probably two pounds a week, so eight pounds a month. So uh, the rent of a large house in Forest Gate would be about a quarter of their salary. Well, how did they make their money? Well, the next slide shows Forest Gate Station. We saw the building of the line earlier on. This shows a train about to depart for central London. Forest Gate was becoming a commuter suburb by 1900. There were substantial increases in uh, the number of trains per day. Notice the chap on the uh, left-hand side, the far left corner of the picture in his top hat and briefcase, probably coming from the Woodgrange estate. Certainly there were uh, middle-class workers uh, traveling into London, but there were also provision for people earning much less on the, on the early morning workmen's trains. And this meant that commuter traffic was building up quite substantially. Now, we don't have a photograph of Forest Gate in the rush hour, but we do have this one of Leytonstone in uh, 1905. We know that these are people waiting for the 918 train into uh, Liverpool Street from Leytonstone. And you can see that everybody on the platform looks like a white collar worker. There are two or three women on the platform as well. Remember women now are working as well as men. So commuter traffic was building substantially. And the quote here shows, this was what it says on the back of this postcard. We don't catch this train. When we start, it's busier than this. And the trains were becoming very, very crowded. And the next slide shows the inevitable consequence of that overcrowded trains and here is John Wilkinson up before the West Ham magistrates uh, because he and his pal had got into a scuffle on a train as they tried to get into an overcrowded carriage and given someone a black eye. That cost him a 10 shilling fine which is probably about 40 pounds today and a wigging from the chairman of the bench saying passengers really must not forcibly enter, enter full compartments because it's, it's fortunate that that would never happen today. And next, so this was quite a stressful way of traveling. And so you could relieve your stress by a cup of tea. And this is East Ham Underground Station today. That, this sign is still visible. In those days, it was the station of the London uh, Tilbury and South End Railway, which ran into Fenchurch Street. And you could buy a cup of tea on the platform. You can still see the old refreshment room at East Ham Station. It's bricked up now. 
You can also see just above the ghost sign, the insignia of the London uh, Tilbury and South End Railway in, in the raw time work. The railway companies were very, paid a lot of attention to their image and they spent a lot of money on fitting their stations out with uh, wrought iron work and um, fancy uh, carving. And this is, this is a wonderful survival. London, Transport for London do a great job in preserving these, these survivals. So next, see, it wasn't just about commuting. It was also the railway companies were cottoned on very early on to the fact that excursions into the countryside would be uh, a popular. And so this advertisement from the Great Eastern from the 1890s shows that trains from Liverpool Street out to Manor Park, Forest Gate, um, and further afield uh, to walk for a stroll in the forest, perhaps, you could get out to Forest Gate for sevenpence a third class return, which is probably about just over two pounds today. So quite affordable for people whose earnings were beginning to rise at this time. You could also take excursions from Forest Gate and down to the okay. coast. And here we can see cheap excursions down to uh, Burnham on Crouch. And again, quite affordable, one and six, a return, third class return uh, to Burnham on Crouch. So that would be about five pounds today. So a clerk or a skilled worker and his family could afford a day out in the country. But there were other outdoor activities which were available locally. and. Here's one that was very popular in Forest Gate in the 1890s. The cycling boom took off really after 1888 with the invention of the pneumatic tyre. And cycling was a relatively cheap entertainment. Bikes like these would cost probably two to three months wages for a clerk or a, a school worker. Clark Brothers was one of 17. There were 17 bike builders in Forest Gate in 1900. Here's the, this is the biggest. Uh, Clark Brothers, they were building about two and a half thousand bikes a year by 1900 from their works in Danes Road. Um, and you can see on the right hand side, there is that the top right is a ladies bike. So as they would say, so women were taking up cycling as well. And as the next slide shows, Forest Gate was an ideal location. Here is Wanstead Flats with local people enjoying the wide open spaces of the forest right on their doorstep. This is Wanstead Platts looking south towards Forest Gate in 1910. And you can see on the left a woman a cyclist, and there's actually another one just a little bit further back down the road. They could be members of cycling clubs. There were very many cycling clubs in East London by 1900. They were based on pubs, they were based on church groups, they were political groups, the Clarion Cycling Clubs, a socialist group. And cycling clubs were popular because they were often. They were mixed groups and they were a way of young people to socialise uh, respectively. So uh, cycling became an incredibly popular pastime in Forest Gate. Well, as the next slide shows, any respectable suburb needs its own public hall. And here is Forest Gates built in 1902. It didn't last long as a public hall. It became a theatre by 1907 and then a cinema um, and remained a cinema until uh, probably around the beginning of the war. It opened and closed several times. The other feature of this building was that it had a very big ballroom. And in the early days, if you had a social event in Forest Gate, you would go to the Grand Theatre to, to host it. But by the 1930s, this, as many local people remember, this had become, the, the ballroom had become a skating rink. After the demise of the theatre and the cinema, in the 1960s, this had a, a new lease of life, of course, as the famous Uppercut Club, which opened um, in 1966, featuring The Who on the bill, and attracted many top names in music throughout the 60s. Jimi Hendrix played there, Stevie Wonder, Nina Simone, The Kinks, The Small Faces, Georgie Faye, the list goes on and on. Sadly, this building no longer exists. You can see the uh, entrance to it on Woodgrange Road, just to... In fact, if we go to the next photo, um, we can see it's just on the left hand side here where the cursor is pointing. Forest Creek was a great shopping centre. And remember, of course, people would walk to the shops in, in those days and all the basics were available in Forest Gate at that time. There was a big Sainsbury's. You could buy any fruit and veg and meat and fish. Um, there was a sewing machine shop. There was even 
a dance school um, on the corner of Hampton Road. And you can see in the, on the left-hand side of the picture, the blue arrow, you can see that you could also get home deliveries. This is Steedman's. It's a hand, hand cart owned by Steedman's The Bakery, uh, which is based in Maryland. And you can get Steedman's The Bakers to come and deliver to your home. Just one feature of this, which sadly has changed uh, dramatically, is that on the left-hand side, the far left corner, is the Princess Alice pub. And in the center of the photo, in the middle ground, you can see uh, the Methodist Church. Both of these buildings destroyed during the bombing of, in the Second World War. So on the theme of home deliveries, the next slide shows another bakery that delivered locally in Forest Gate. This is Smith, the bakers in Odessa Road in Forest Gate. This is a reminder that fresh produce was delivered daily to people in the locality. That remember, Forest Gate is still very much a rural location or a semi-rural location on the edge of the countryside. Peter showed the picture of Aldersbrook Farm. That was that moved down the road from when it was bought by for the cemetery. It moved. It's now the petrol station on Aldersbrook Road was where the second Aldersbrook Farm um, stood. So there were farms and dairies uh, all around the, the locality. And the supplies were often uh, local produce. There was, a, for example, a, a dairy in Manor Park, which, would, which advertised direct from the farm to the consumer uh, within a few hours of milking. So milk could be delivered to your door straight from the cow. Milk in the morning, delivered in the afternoon. Just to come towards the end of this tour of Forest Gate, just to say something about the new communities, because Forest Gate after 1870 was the home of wave after wave of, of new migrants. Um, the er very earliest arrivals, of course, came from inner London and from East Anglia. But gradually the, uh, the web spread out and people began to arrive from other parts of England and then Scotland and Ireland and, and then from Europe, from mainland Europe. And it was, from its very earliest days, a very mixed community. Earlham Hall here on the left was a meeting place of the Irish community, uh, a great centre. In fact, Forest Gate was known as um, a centre of the Irish diaspora in, in Britain. And Earlham Hall was the scene of, was the venue for classes in Gaelic, for Irish dancing. It was also the home of the Gaelic League, the local branch of the Gaelic League, which promoted Irish culture and Irish nationalism. And just down the road from here lived a, for, for a time while he was a, a young man um, who was born in Forest Gate, Francis Fitzgerald, who was an Irish nationalist who um, was at the Easter uprising in 1916 and was the grandfather of the uh, Irish tea shop in the 1970s, Garrett Fitzgerald. So a very, very strong connection to the Irish community, but other communities too. Earlham Hall also was the very first venue for uh, the Jewish community uh, who arrived in Forest Gate uh, at the end of the 19th century. They used it as a temporary home until they built their, their synagogue a little further down Earlham Grove opened in 1911. So right from the earliest times, Forest Gate has been a centre of incomers from all over the all over Britain and indeed the world. So to move on and to uh, to finish talk, I'm just going to do a very quick walk from Forest Gate Station in about 1900 up to Wanstead Flats to show you just a little more of what the street scene would have looked like. So on arrival at Forest Gate, you could see that traffic was um, uh, not a major problem. Even the tram cars didn't move that fast. And notice another woman cyclist incidentally on the right. And the next slide we move on. This is setting off from the station. A similar photograph to the one Peter showed earlier on. Many features still recognisable today, including, of course, the clock and the water trough, but also the little chapel on the left hand side um, it's still there. Uh, it's now uh, behind a uh, hardware store, but you can still see it. And the next slide shows uh, we're moving past the end of Siebert Road. You can just see, I'm sorry, it's not terribly clear, but you can just see uh, the cab rank. The horse-drawn cabs were drawn up on the, at the end of Siebert Road. My aunt, actually, who had, whose godmother lived um, in Forest Gate in the 1920s, remembers in the 1920s that those, some of those horse-drawn cabs were 
were still operating even after the First World War. You can also see here a street fire escape. I won't say more than that, but if you want to know more about uh, the fire service in uh, Forest Gate and West Ham, I refer you to Peter's excellent book, definitive work on West Ham Fire Brigade. And just to say, just to note in this photograph, notice this is a hot, a hot summer's day. Uh, all the awnings are out over the shop fronts. The ladies are carrying parasols, but they're all wearing incredibly heavy clothing. And the next photo uh, shows um, looking back down towards Forest Gate under the uh, Tottenham Forest Gate Railway Bridge built in 1893. Again, a summer's day, but look at how people are dressed. These two lads on the right with their knickerbockers and their uh, shirts and ties must have been incredibly hot. So we're now the next slide, we're going to leave the bustle of uh, Woodgrange Road into the quiet of uh, Chestnut Avenue. This is the top end of Chestnut Avenue, a very old road, one probably one of the oldest roads in Forest Gate. And notice the trees planted in the road, or rather I think what happened was that the pavement was put in after the trees were planted, but they had no problem about trees being uh, uh, sitting in the road there. These are not the trees that are there today, unfortunately. So we get, the next slide shows us on Wanstead Flats, we're on the corner of Wanstead Flats, Woodgrange Road and Capel Road, where we can get our tram back home uh, to these trams actually from Forest Gate that were ter terminating Forest Gate. They ran right down to the docks. We had to get all the way down to the docks, very cheap way of traveling and the preferred way that most people moved around uh, Forest Gate, West Ham, and indeed East London at the time. So just finishing though, just to show you one or two things that have now long gone from Forest Gate, uh, the next slide shows some entertainment on Wanstead Flats. This is, uh, this is the evening promenade on Wanstead Flats, known, uh, this is where young men and women could go and stroll, and sort of passagiata in the evening. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't called that in, by the locals. It was known rather derisively as the Monkey Parade. These were very popular right across East London around the turn of the 19th, 20th century. Sunday evening stroll, in this case on Wanstead Flats. I just should point out that I didn't want to do it on Wanstead Flats. I didn't want to do it was a popular song of 1913. It was the biggest hit of 1913, and I'm sure no double meaning was in, intended here. So the next slide shows us the monkey parade in a photograph of around 1900. These trees are now mature trees, a line of mature trees. Sadly, a lake is now on the left, the pond is now only seasonal, and the bandstand has disappeared. It, the bandstand survived until the 1950s, um, but has now disappeared and is um, a circle of trees on Wanstead Flats. So finally, moving on to our final slide, and to thank you really for listening to our talk. This is looking south from Wanstead Flats to Forest Gate uh, around 1900. You can see the traffic is not overburdened with traffic here. So thank you for listening. And this is our uh, email address. If anybody would like to uh, email us with information or updates or further thoughts, we'd be uh, most grateful. We're, we're by no means the definitive, ha have the definitive answers on everything to do with Forest Gate's history. But I think there may be just time for some of the folk, uh, the questions that have come up on the chat, perhaps. Thank you so much, um, Mark and Peter. That, that was such an interesting talk and just beautifully illustrated as well. I've got a few questions that were popped into chat. A question from Chris is, do you have more information on, the, on Pritchard and Company, which was the advert on the back of the tram in the first slide, I believe. I don't, and I don't know whether Peter does. What we tend, to do, we tend to do in circumstances like this is start beavering away to try and find information. So uh, if we find anything, I'm not sure who answer, asked the question, but we'll, we'll do, do contact us and we'll see if we can turn anything up. I imagine it's probably highly likely to be a local company. Okay. Um, next question was from Ifra. How did people use that strip of land across Capel Road? It's so narrow. It's only about two or three feet 
So it wasn't really used much at all. And in the modern landscape, it's quite a thick hedge with substantial trees. One or two of the householders do dump their garden compost in the ditch. And they're not fly tipping because they're actually putting their garden waste on their own tiny bit of land. So um, I don't really think it was used much at all. And legally, it's slightly unclear why they had a strip of land the other side of the road. So we don't altogether know. It's a bit of a mystery as to why it was like that. So actually, someone answered a couple of the questions. Uh, Asif asked what the name of your book was, Peter. And I think someone kindly answered that for him. Uh, West Ham Fire Brigade and Illustrated History. And uh, it's available um, on eBay and certain other online booksellers. And of course, it's in Newham Bookshop, the most important bookshop in East London. Do go to Newham Bookshop. Uh, you can phone them up and order. They've got loads of local history books. So just phone Newham Bookshop up. They are functioning uh, over the phone and uh, they'll be opening their door in a couple of weeks. Very important bookshop for local history. Somebody, Lots somebody... of thank yous, brilliant presentation. They love the talk, everyone, Peter and Mark. So thank you for that. Thank you very much for coming along. Thanks everybody for coming. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Yeah. We enjoyed yep. it.